And for our final story for this edition of The Rolling Stone, we dive right back into the sewer that is academia. You probably have never heard of Jane Ward, which is as it should be, just like you probably have never heard of the three dozen bureaucratic pencil pushers in Washington or your local state capital that actually probably have far more influence over your life and the lives of everyone in your family than good old King George III ever did over any American life. And in one way, that's good. That's as it should be because politics isn't the end all and be all. However, I am going to say that unknowns like Jane Ward and academia are more dangerous than the unknowns in the political bureaucracy. Yes, those pencil pushers can cause you at the very least annoyance and at the very most actually acute pain, whether that's through harassment, fines or even being taken to court in the here and now. But people like Jane Ward, academics like her who sit in their ivory or at the very least ivory plated towers and spin their narratives in a pseudo-scientific, pseudo-historical way are actually laying the groundwork for even worse harm in the future for us and for future generations. Jane Ward, to get back to her, has written a book called I Kid You Not Gang, the Tragedy of Heterosexuality. And since this is being reviewed by the New York Times, you just know that we're in for a treat. Per the Times' review of this book, quote, Ward distinguishes straightness as a practice from straight culture, which is the very heart of society's most disgraceful failures. It is not, as one popular joke goes, that straight people are not okay. It is that heteronormativity creates a powerful, privileged form of sexuality against which historically and currently all other forms are compared. In examining the pressure to partner with the opposite gender, we find the exhortations of capitalism, the misogyny of violence against women, the racist and xenophobic erasure of non-white families, and the homophobic hatreds that pervade so much of everyday life. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's it. So, so, so that's it. Um, can I just say that this is pure on, full on insanity, the idea that the, the idea that straight culture is some artificial construction created for the sole purpose to oppress women, to oppress people who aren't white, to oppress you know, people who are not straight is ludicrous. First of all, the fact that it is made to oh, oppress people who aren't white if you look at the history of the world, if you actually are multicultural and you look at different cultures, different parts of the world in all areas of time, you will find the vast, 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 vast majority of everyone was straight. Whether they were white, whether they were black, whether they were brown, whether they were red, whether they were yellow, whether they were green, whether they were purple, whether, whether they were indigo, it doesn't matter. They were straight. Why? Because most people, men and women, and again, when I say most, I mean the vast, vast, vast majority of the human race. It was back in 2014 when the Center for Disease Control released a new study that said, actually, the percentage of people who identify as some form of LGBTQIA2 plus was minutely small. It was like 1.6% of the male American population identified as gay, and maybe 1.4 or 1.3% identified as lesbian. It was infinitesimally small. It wasn't the 5 or 10% of the population that we had always heard about. It wasn't anywhere close to that. Now, those numbers, you might be quick to point out, have actually been growing. More and more people are identifying as gay, as lesbian, as transgender is actually very, very popular. But you will notice that it is a lot of younger people, millennials, Gen Zers, who are identifying as that. My two cents as to why that's happening is because kids, through the culture, through their education, 
So basically 24 seven are being told that if they, you know, if they like to, if, if they're a boy, but, oh, they like to, or if they're, a, you know, if, if they're a boy, but they like just the color pink, okay? They like a pink handkerchief. They like the color rose, for example. John Wayne wore rose-colored shirts in a lot of his movies. Then, oh, that means that you're either gay or that actually means that you're a girl. You're a girl and you don't even know. You're a girl trapped in a boy's body. Similarly, girls are being taught that if you have any sort of feelings of disgust against your own body, like if you're going towards uh, through puberty, then that automatically means that you're not really a girl. You're just a boy trapped in a girl's body. And therefore, we need to put you on these hormonal depressants. We need to pump you full of testosterone or estrogen. You need to save up and you need to tell your parents that for your birthday, you don't want that new, uh, the, the Apple 12, or you don't want... I don't know, whatever game now is popular. I don't keep track of games or whatever. What you want for your birthday, for Christmas, etc., is you want gender reassignment surgery. You want to start towards that. Oh, and also, here's your new name. Here's your new pronouns. Go to town. And then uh, completely harass and persecute any bigot who actually raises your hand, who raises their hand and says, you know, you're only 12 years old. Maybe, you, maybe, maybe this is just a phase that you're going through. <laughs> I would say that that is part of it. I would also say part that being part of the Rainbow Coalition is one way of absolving white guilt, which does not innately exist in us, but which has been forced upon us again by the ideologically infested culture. Now that wokeness is mainstream, Kids, especially young kids, are told day and night, night and day, that if they are white, they are racist. They are irrevocably, inherently racist. And the only way to actually stop being oppress oppressive, stop being an oppressor, is to become one of the oppressed. And therefore, to identify as bisexual, or lesbian, or trans, or asexual, or pansexual, or ecosexual, or whatever you want. The sky's the limit. That is how I would actually answer that. So, this idea that it oppresses non-white people, it's a farce. The idea <laughs> that it's misogynistic is absolutely a farce. Have there been oppressive relationships? Absolutely. Have there also been great relationships? Absolutely. The idea that marriage is inherently an oppressive uh, 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 relationship is nonsensical. It's, it, it's nonsensical. Especially because many women have said that they want marriage. They want marriage. More than that, they want to become stay-at-home moms. They want to become what is known in whispered in the dark corridors. They want to be a traditional housewife. They want to stay home, take care of the home, take care of the kids, etc., etc., etc. They say, I am fulfilled as a woman in that. I am fulfilled as a woman by having children, by being married to a man to my husband and having children because that but because becoming a mother is the fulfillment of my womanhood because biologically speaking that's why women exist to have children sorry to put it bluntly but there it is these women are intelligent they're educated but because and, and they have their own lived experience they have their own lived experience so in order to get around that the left has said well you're not really a woman you're not politically a woman. And the idea that it has the extortions of capitalism, misogyny, uh, xenophobia, that, 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 that's nonsense. That's nonsense. Xenophobia is probably referring um, to the Jim Crow laws that didn't allow uh, black Americans and white Americans to marry each other. But that is just what that is actually that is the exception that proves the rule because in many other cultures, in many other parts of the world, white people did marry people that were not you know, of their own race, we might say. When the British 
ruled India, a lot of British colonists there had Indian wives. And they were, it was seen as no big deal. So everything about this, everything about this is cockeyed and screwy. And it is meant to be. And in fact, the left can't even agree what the message of Jane Ward's book is. So all the reviews say, oh, it's very easy to read. It's very quotable. I don't even believe it. What do I mean by that? Well, listen to this. Uh, Pink News says that a gender and sexuality professor has written a book explaining the secret to straight people having happier relationships. Be more like queer couples. That's what Pink News says. However, Bitch Media says that the actual message of the book is telling straight couples not to become like queer couples, but to become more straight. To become more straight. Because she says, um, Jane Ward says, that you have to become deep sexuality, okay? What she says, to desire women humanely, to bleep, <laughs> fire truck, and be feminist comrades at the same time. She calls this deep heterosexuality. And she lays some central tenets of lesbianism as guidelines. Most critical is the idea of love as an encounter between two subjects in which each person reaffirms and delights in the subjectivity of the other. I uh, hate to spoil it, bitch media, but that ain't. That might be a tenant of political and social lesbianism, but you actually stole that from personalism, the philosophical movement uh, known as personalism, which started in the later part of the 19th century, really came to its own in the 20th century. And you want to know who really, who really took personalism and ran with it, made it popular? Catholic philosophers like Jacques Maritain, like Karl Wojtyla, whom you all probably know better as Pope John Paul II. Yeah, a Catholic Pope was preaching personalism before the lesbians, uh, before the political lesbians had gotten a hold of it. So at the end of the day, what does this all mean? What, what, what does this mean? Well, there is a very interesting part in the New York Times' review of it which really gives the game away. This is what it says, quote, Our desires may feel beyond our control, but Ward stresses the importance of understanding sexuality as self-identified. One of the foundational principles of lesbian feminism is that each person's sexual desire is their own responsibility, Ward writes. If not something they can choose, then at least something they can choose to examine and take ownership of. As such, she argues a queer theory influenced by the thinkers of the 70s and 80s like Rich, Audre Lorde, and Barbara Smith, as well as present-day academics such as Sarah Ahmed, might be just the thing to rescue heterosexuality from its unearned hegemony in our shared cultural imagination. There you go. You have to take ownership of your sexuality and of your sexual identity. Now, in the first place, uh, isn't that a little too close to preference? I mean, aren't you making an outdated and offensive assumption there? Uh, she might actually have to rescind her book before too long if people start noting that connection. But listen to that again. Each person's sexual desire is their own responsibility, something they can examine and take ownership of. That is analyzing ourselves to such a degree what it what it does it is opening the door for anything i take responsibility for my sexuality i own it i control it and therefore this is what i want to do this is what i want to do and then when you couple it with saying for example from bitch media again you know, saying that you, that, that straight men, straight women coming together, they have to be feminist comrades at the same time. What that means is that for heterosexuality to not be oppressive, to be fixed, quote unquote, 
is to basically get rid of every single ethical norm when it comes to sexuality. Monogamy is gone. To own your sexuality might mean, hey, I want a threesome now. Or, hey, you know what? I want to be in an open relationship that is trustworthy. We tell each other everything and we just use the other person, you know, but that's what I want to do. Okay? Having a group marriage. You know, Wh whatever you want, basically, that is what you have to do. That is what you have to agree with it. You have to be okay with it because that's the only way that women will actually be free in a heterosexual relationship. And that opens the door, like I said, to basically giving you carte blanche for doing whatever you want. Hey, I want to do this. Okay, we're going to do that. That is what is happening. The last trembling verges of, uh, of sexual ethics, especially in marriage, like monogamy, like faithfulness, like permanence, are now being completely eradicated all in the name of freedom and all based on lesbianism. I'll say it again. <sighs> Everyone was sold on the idea. Everyone said, everyone, uh, especially on the left, said, oh, you know what, gay marriage, that will be fine because that's just going to give gay people the very things that straight people have, the permanence, the monogamy, and everything. And what are we seeing? We are seeing actually the gay culture completely transform marriage itself. It's not marriage transforming the gay culture, you know, where we don't want bathhouses anymore, uh, you know, we don't want you know, uh, monogamish relationships, etc., etc. We want what you guys have. Stable relationship, recognized by the law, 2.5 kids, the little white pickety fez, all nice and respectable. Uh-uh. What we are seeing now is the exact reversal of that. Not marriage transforming the gay culture, but the gay culture transforming marriage. This book is an academic argument for that in the name of freedom, in the name of feminism, in the name of getting rid of oppression and xenophobia and homophobia, etc., 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 etc. Make no doubt about this, gang. These ideas in this book are going to cause more harm to marriage, and therefore they are going to cause more harm to the sexes, to men and to women, and how men and women react to each other, how we think about each other, than we could possibly know. Those were already going down the tube, but this is only going to cause more harm down the road, which might even be the entire point. It might be the entire point because people might just say, you know, Heck with it. I'm not going to get married. It's too much of a headache. I don't believe in it. You know what? I'll just use people every now and then to get my jollies. And when that happens, when the family is gone, because that's the ultimate end goal. If you destroy marriage, you destroy the family. I mean, the two are so intimately linked. When the family is gone, the family which is the cornerstone of society, something has to take its place, doesn't it? And what is that going to be? That's what they don't tell you. But gang, I have ranted and raved and bemoaned long enough for this week. So I am calling it quits for right now. Have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay free, and I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.